Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Weaver. Welcome back to the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. In each episode, I make a dish inspired by a new book while talking to its author. Today's book is Everything is Under Control, and I'm making caramelized onion tart with black olives. I'd like to welcome the author of Everything is Under Control, Phyllis Grant. Welcome, Phyllis. It's great to have you in the kitchen. Thank you, Stephanie. It's really fun to be in your kitchen. I'm looking forward to this chat. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with the title, Is Everything Under Control in the book? <laughs> I love that question because every time, here's my book, every time I sign it, I circle everything is under control on the title page and I write ha 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 because <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing is under control, but we keep trying, right? Absolutely. Just, that's, that's life. That's life. Yeah. So give us the broad strokes. So this is the paperback edition is out now. Give us the broad strokes of what the book kind of covers. Well, it really covers uh, the first 45 years of my life. So it covers my um, young days as a dancer in New York City. And then I was a birth doula and I had some children and a bunch of postpartum depression and I got married and, you know, just sort of these milestones in my life. And it's a very spare book told in short vignettes, but it really covers a lot of time. Most of my life, I'm 51 now. So it, you know, covers up until about six years ago. And it ends with 17 recipes that are more like templates and you've made one of them. So you've made a tart of mine, which I like to think that all these recipes um, will give people some freedom to play and make, you know, make the recipes their own. So I look forward to hearing what you did with my recipe. Great. So what inspired you to write this book now? What was, what was the impetus for writing it? You know, in many ways, I've been writing it for the past 30 years. I, I have written in order to process things in some ways as a form of therapy or as a, as a way to, to understand birth, understand marriage, understand the hardships. And a lot of the book came from emails that I wrote to my friends and these stories that I wrote over and over again over the years. Great. And is there anything readers need to know beforehand? You mentioned it's spare and vignettes. And you want to explain a little bit more what that means, just so readers are kind of prepared, even though you don't need to be prepared. But Well, well, yeah, that's in some ways what I've loved about this book over the past years is it's, it's been a, a very challenging year, of course, for a lot of people on the pandemic. And uh, attention spans have been sort of limited. Um, so especially if you're someone who's been struggling with attention, your attention span, this, this book really might be for you because I, I cover a lot with very, very few words. So some people have read it in one sitting and some people have just read a page a day over a month. So I think there are many ways to, um, to relate to this book and to bring it into your life. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite character or moment? Oh, let's see. Wow. Ooh, I, so many of these moments I, I chose because they are so important. You know, the birth of my children and my marriage. And, uh, and maybe, maybe it's my daughter's birth because that was the first childbirth that I went through. It just felt like a, a, like a, just a turning point in my life as, as a woman and sort of finding my strength and figuring out how to be a mom. It was uh, really difficult and also really, really powerful and moving. And it's a story that I loved writing and rewriting. And I still love rereading it, actually. That's great. So I'm featuring this book because it it really reads like a freight train. So I'm one of those, and I mean that in the best possible way. I started it and I literally read it in one sitting. Um, I just couldn't even believe like how you accomplished that as a writer. I was super impressed with how much you packed into these vignettes and how you skipped across time and yet I was never lost which is not easy to do. I'm working on a memoir myself, and it's just not easy to do. Oh, wow. um, I loved the, the vignettes, and I really appreciated the recipes. And so um, I was super excited to find out that this book came out last year, but um, the paperback edition just came out, so we're celebrating that on the show. So I was really excited to be able to feature you in season two because I really thought it was an extraordinary um, piece of writing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Those are amazing words to hear. I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah. So the recipe that I'm making today is caramelized onion tart with black olives. And um, so a couple of things, I, we'll talk more about the recipe afterwards, but the reason that we chose it is because um, in one of your incarnations in the book, you were a pastry chef in New York City and, and you worked as a chef. And so, um, so I felt like pastry because that's where you started was important to reflect the book. 
And then you and I talked about should it be the strawberry tart with balsamic glaze, which I did try making, or the caramelized onion tart. And um, because the, the strawberry tart is a little um, more particular about ingredients and they're really very seasonal, um, you wanted, we thought that this would be one people could make anytime year round. Um, and I'd never actually followed this process of making the caramelized onion. So I was trying to learn something new myself as I do the show. So thank you. The instructions were great on the yeah. caramelization. So did oh, not, good. Did I'm not glad. burn them. <laughs> so good. Great. Yeah, it takes a long time, doesn't it? You yes. really have to be patient. Yeah. Absolutely. So what I chose for Phyllis to read today are two short passages because these are vignettes. They are usually very, very short. But I chose the two um, because I feel like they'll give you all a, a real good flavor of some of the themes that happen in the book. So as Phyllis mentioned, she was a dancer at Juilliard, then she was working as a nanny, um, then she ended up working as a chef, uh, there's, there, you had disordered eating, then you get married, then you had kids and, and a postpartum depression. So there's a lot of stuff that's packed into this book. And so I chose two short vignettes for you to read. So why don't you set up the first one and then I'm going to check on the chart while you're doing that. So kind of tell us how old you are, where you are, what's going on, and then, then go ahead and read the passage that I asked in a restaurant. I was 23 years old. I had just graduated from Juilliard. And I had this idea about restaurants uh, that they were sort of these very quiet, clean, calm places where everyone had these crisp white aprons on and everyone spoke quietly and mostly to each other. And I have no idea where I got that idea. <laughs> but it was that was not the case. So this is sort of my first experience in the swirl and chaos of a restaurant kitchen. So should I go ahead and read this? Sure. Okay. I am in the way. Hop behind you. Everyone is yelling. Coming through, on your left. It's my first day as a pastry assistant at a large restaurant that is one of the busiest lunch services in Midtown. Lawyers and agents fill the tables. Arugula salads and chicken breasts stuffed with goat cheese fill their plates. Pick up, pick up now. An 85 the foie. While plating desserts, the pastry chef tells me what to do. When you're done with lunch service, please bake off the chocolate chip cookies. You will need to peel and core a minimum of 20 apples a day. I'll talk you through the tart de tin when we have a little more time. For the ice cream custard, you'll find the chinois and the bain marie downstairs by the walk-in. Oh, and the 10x is in the pantry next to the linens. We oui, chef! VIP desserts coming up. Pick up table 10. Fuck, I need some runners. Would you bring me a few hotel pans? Someone keeps take, taking my stash. I don't understand. Read off the dupes for me, will you? I wanna make sure we have enough cheesecake to get through service. How many all day? I am panicking. How many cheesecakes? She points to the tickets that are lined up above the pastry station. I try to decipher the scribbles. Five cheesecakes? She double checks the orders. Five, yes, all day, that's right. You should put your hair back or chef will say something inappropriate. Buy some boots or clogs, something with a hard toe. Knives fall. She yells to the dishwasher. Por favor, can you wash dress sheet pans for the new girl? She has a thousand cookies to make. Gracias. Oh, and Phyllis, please chop these pecans while I get some family meal. You want some? Looks pretty decent today. I ask where I can find the knives to chop the nuts. You don't have your own knives? I stop asking questions. Thank you. So I think that gives you a feeling for the kitchen and that part of your world and that part of your life that um, passage and um, I'm going to pull the tart out and have you take a look and tell me if you think it's done. It's oh yeah, great. Winding down. Golden looking. All right, so you had said that one way you can tell if they're finished, let me see if I can get this in the right spot. Can you see it? I can't see the tar well, I can see the sheet pan. Okay, let's see. see Maybe when you lift it up, yeah. I'll see. Yeah. So, if it's doing that, do we think it's done? If you can, can you see? 
Yeah. 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 It's like a like a board, sort of like yeah. a, a. I think stiff it needs board. a couple more minutes. So I'm just gonna. Okay. It's just gonna slide around, but um, it's getting brown, but I think it's still a little soft in the middle. So I'm gonna put it back in. Okay. I'm gonna have you read the second little passage, and then I'll pull it out time right after my son was born so my son was my second child my my daughter was born four and a half years before this and I had some pretty extreme postpartum depression um, that really interfered in uh, bonding with my daughter so uh, this is me trying to understand how to bond with my son perhaps a little more quickly the second time around I trick myself into loving him I say I love you I love you I love you so much, even though I don't feel it, even though I don't believe it, because love must be cumulative. This time, I tell anyone who will listen. I describe the pit in my stomach, the deep sadness I feel all over my body, how I kill him over and over again in my head. I feed him solid foods as early and as much as I can anything to not feel like he is part of my body. I puree stew. I mix avocados with yogurt. I mash squash and potatoes. I take photos. Through the viewfinder, I watch him explore. I press the shutter of my camera down halfway, focusing on his eyeball. He looks up like a puppy. Those eyes, they help. After eight months, I start to tip over into love. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Um, so, viewers and readers, I hope that you'll get you've gotten a flavor of the very many kinds of scenes that are in this book, but also just the beauty of her writing. And Phyllis, did did you hear from a lot of people who'd suffered from postpartum depression that the book really um, mirrored their um, their experience? I did. A lot of people DM'd me on Instagram to tell me their stories. And, and I put, at the end of the book, I have a, a special email that I set up for people who needed support, either who needed me to help help them find support or if they just needed to, to talk to me a little bit. So a lot of people reached out over the past year. I've been really moved by so many of their stories. And also um, so grateful that the fact that I told my stories helped normalize things for other people and formed a, a community for all of us. Absolutely. Because I know it's not something a lot of people have talked about. I know when Brooke Shields talked about it, she got a lot of flack years ago. And, um, and But I think that, that every time those stories get told, it does normalize and it does help people feel like they're not crazy and they're, they're literally going through an experience where they you know really need help and really need support and possibly medication and all those things. So I want to thank you for Absolutely. Being, being so honest. Um, I was also really touched by um, by the disordered eating that you shared, which I've I've struggled with for a long time as well. So um, so yeah, there was a lot. Even though I don't have kids, there was a lot that I related to, a lot I really appreciated. So um, so thank you for that. I'm gonna pull the tart out, and uh, hopefully it's finished now. I guess I mentioned it's this is gluten free puff pastry, so it's not as puffy as normal puff pastry would be. Um, a little tricky to, but yeah, I think it is finished. Right, so I'm just going to slide it over here, and it did crack, and but you know, everything is sort of under control, right? So okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to keep rolling here. Um, so this is the so this is the only gluten free puff pastry that I know of that exists, which is Char. It's made in Italy. Um, I'm showing them the box. So if you're intrigued, uh, you can give it a, a shot. Um, I'm not sure, it, it rarely does seem like it should be puffier than this, but I'm sure it'll taste quite delicious. So I'm going to go ahead and cut a piece. And then tell us just very briefly, oh, so I'm going to just tilt it up. So um, tell us what a piece a la dier is, which is what this is. Oh, it's well, it's a caramelized onion tart. And the I learned how to caramelize onions, and I think this is in the head note back, uh, gosh, I think in my early 20s. It was actually one of the first things, um, first recipes I wrote, along with my mom, we wrote a recipe for a goat cheese and caramelized onion 
tart. So that's when I started doing it and started understanding how it, it, you really have to cook these onions low and slow with a lid and you have to pay attention to them. And the goal is after sometimes an hour, an hour and a half to have these, uh, they're almost like, it's almost like compote, like jam. It's very sweet. And then you smear that on any crust that you're using on the raw crust. And then you top it as a, you know, have a counterbalance um, of very salty anchovies and briny olives. So for me, it's just the ultimate um, balance of flavors, sweet and salty and briny. Great. And, and crispy. Yeah. And when yeah, would you, so this is, would you have this for lunch with a green salad? I feel like you said also you like it for breakfast. Is that the next day? Yes. Yeah. I like savory things for breakfast, but I think that for me, um, I always serve a bright crispy green salad with it, maybe with some avocado. Again, that counterbalance of, of flavors and textures, I think it's very important because it's in, it's intense. It's very rich yes. and it needs, it needs the brightness of the salad, I find. But, you know, you also could serve it with cheese. You could have it with soup. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty versatile thing. And it's a great cut in small pieces for hors d'oeuvres. Oh, look at that. Look how beautiful. So it's not Aww. as puffy as I think it would be if it was regular puff pastry. But, um, but I'm sure it'll taste quite delicious. And so I did, so I have to be on a low sodium diet because I get migraine attacks. So I've used the, I skipped the anchovies this time. Um, and I, um, I, I sliced the olives so that they would, there are fewer of them, but the, you kind of get the flavor. So I'm going to go ahead and just have a quick taste off the corner here. Mmm. It's definitely crispy. So even though it's not super puffy, I'm definitely getting the crispiness. I think describing the onions as jammy is a perfect so if you've ever had like a savory tomato bacon jam, it's kind of in that same category. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, I like that. Lovely. And you know what else, Stephanie? I was thinking, sorry to interrupt you, no. I apologize. I was just thinking, you've said several times that it's not puffy enough, but I think that's fine. I mean, I think you can make it with all different kinds of crust, actually. It can be made on a flatbread. I mean, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think it works well with, with any kind of crust. Absolutely. So I'm glad that you experimented with the gluten-free. Yeah, and then I, um, I didn't have the right mustard the first time I made it and the mustard I used was way like overpowered it so today I actually just spread a very thin layer of mayonnaise because I wanted to have something under the onions and I think that was a good choice so I love that choice yeah. mayonnaise is fabulous I often put that under cheese for a cheese toast I think mayonnaise adds a, a, a fabulous layer of fat and flavor and sort of a glue for things so that's, that's, that's nice to hear. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so the recipe tip that I'm going to offer is to follow the instructions precisely on the box, but follow her instructions for the timing of the tart and then do follow her instructions to make the caramelized onions because otherwise you can burn them or, and you just have to have time. It's one of those dishes that I'll, I'll be making three or four other things and it's just sitting on a burner and I'll just check it every once in a while. Um, so I do a lot of bulk cooking on the weekends, and so that would might be something that I would just do. But I'm really excited to try the leftover onions on a burger tonight. <laughs> so I'm excited. Oh about yeah, because I think it's going to be very yummy. Um, okay, Phyllis, thank you so much for being here today. You'll find the recipe link in the Facebook video or on my website, migraineleliefrecipes.com. You'll find her at phyllisgrantauthor.com. And she's Dash and Bella on Instagram. She has a great Instagram feed and she's doing a lot of live um, events. So check her out there. And if you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend. You can order a paperback copy of Everything is Under Control wherever you like to buy books. And if you don't have a book buying budget right now, just order it from your local library because that does help authors too when we request books that they purchase. Follow me at S. Weaver MPH so you don't miss an episode, and please like my Facebook page, Stephanie Weaver MPH. Join us next time for another author interview and a dish inspired by their book. Thanks so much for watching The Blue and Yellow Kitchen.